Welcome again, folks, to the Washington Babylon Podcast. I'm your host for this week, Andrew Stewart. This week, we have witnessed some important developments that we feel are worth devoting our show to today. Our friend, comrade, and colleague Barrett Brown has faced censorship this week from social media for work he is doing that all of you need to be hearing about. For years, Brown has studied the behavior of Silicon Valley's big data collection firms, such as the corporation Palantir, owned by Trump-backing oligarch Peter Thiel. Brown's journalism is buttressed by a report titled, Who's Behind ICE? The Tech Companies Fueling Deportations, written by Empower LLC in collaboration with Mihente, Immigrant Defense Project, and the National Immigration Project. One of Palantir's more disturbing corporate actions has been collaborating with Amazon.com in supporting raids by Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, that target undocumented workers. Using information from Facebook, Twitter, public records, and even the DMV, Palantir has designed a map for ICE stored on Amazon cloud computing servers that helps guide their agents with precision to those they target circumventing and nullifying hard-fought protections in so-called sanctuary cities. But there is another aspect to this that is not as obvious but also disturbing. By turning to a third-party private sector vendor to gather and store evidence, ICE is effectively privatizing their evidence gathering and storage procedures, making subpoena power and legal discovery during court proceedings that much more difficult. Joining us to discuss this for the hour is Barrett Brown. So Barrett, you have been covering Palantir and various uh, aspects of that story for many years now. So what uh, are you working on with your book uh, pertinent to that topic or other things in general in your book? Well, yeah, so Palantir uh, plays an ongoing role in the book. You know, and uh, two years ago, even a year and a half ago, uh, it played less of a role. You know, we knew back then uh, after the Team Themis scandal when Anonymous, uh, you know, hacked H.B. Gary, took all these emails, and went through them and discovered uh, all of these very uh, malicious and, and uh really uh, frankly kind of terrifying uh, new aspects uh, of intelligence, of uh, corporate state alliances, of uh, you know, propaganda, surveillance. Uh, we knew it was important back then. Uh, it was one of the things I was, I was, you know, I was always, uh, sort of, you know, uh, bitching at the press for, for not covering sufficiently back then. Uh, you know, but we, what I didn't know, what no one, I guess, knew until uh, last year, when uh, Christopher Wiley at Cambridge Analytica uh, came out and, and uh, announced to British Parliament uh, what Cambridge Analytica had been doing uh, with Palantir and Archimedes, I uh, had no idea the extent to which our fears were uh, uh, not sufficient. As in, we, 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 even we didn't know uh, how quickly these things that we were worried about, like splashback, the, the use of these kinds of uh, practices and technologies, uh, directly against, you know, Western democracies. Uh, we knew those things were going to happen, and, was, and we warned over and over again about it. But but the fact that it happened just five years after this first big scandal, uh, that, that's surprising. And so, you know, in the last year and a half, uh, we've learned more and more about, number one, you know, what else has Palantir been willing to do? And number two, uh, how easy is it for Palantir to brush off these scandals? when they get caught each time. Uh, the, the most, towards the end of the book, and, I, and so this is also something I've been reiterating, uh, some articles I've been doing, uh, I got one coming up for Counterpunch, actually, that goes into this in passing. Uh, you know, th- th- there's a lack of institutional memory uh, in, in that portion of the press that is supposed to be following these things. Uh, after, in 2011, when, when Palantir was first caught uh, in an indefensible scandal against you know, democracy itself against informed consent, 
against, you know, more specifically against journalists and uh, activists and WikiLeaks and uh, et cetera. You know, they, at first they claimed publicly that they were, you know, they found these slides, these, these presentations about the illegal black ops that H.P. Gary uh, was doing, uh, found them abhorrent. You know, they, they you know, were shocked to uh, see these. They, they broke off ties with H.P. Gary. Uh, and then, of course, uh, meanwhile, uh, I was emailing back and forth to Glenn Greenwald at the time. Uh, and I was explaining to him what it was that we had found uh, in those emails. Uh, for one thing, uh, it had been discovered that Palantir had been involved, of course. Uh, second of all, the Palantir, uh, Palantir staffer, uh, Matthew Steckman, was involved specifically in some of the most uh, dubious, some of the most uh, indefensible and uh, criminal uh, aspects of that plot. Uh, third of all, that several other employees were as well, including Eli Bingham. Uh, and fourth, that even their uh, lead counsel, Matthew, Matthew uh, Matt Long, who I actually called uh, – around that time and recorded a conversation, which I've, I've just got back after all these years. Uh, and fifth, Alexander Carr, according to the email, the president of the company uh, himself was aware of this team and this operation from the very beginning. Uh, these, these are all things that, you know, ideally uh, when his company is caught apolog- like lying and then they apologize to one of the victims and uh, lie again and they get turned out, you know, they get caught lying yet again and, and oops, I guess we all knew about it. Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, ideally, that's something the press keeps an eye on after that. Uh, but in this case, what happened was Palantir put there that one employee on leave, Matthew Stackman. He was the one that was most uh, commonly in, in the articles that came out uh, identified with these uh, these things they were doing. Put, put him on leave, and then a few months later, uh, when the press, particularly the New York Times, have uh, moved, moved, you know, moved on, decided the story is over because chronologically time has passed, and, you know, uh, anything else comes out, oops, that's too late. The story's already over. Uh, they brought him back on, uh, and then they promoted him, the, the guy they blamed. So, so it's not that many. It's, 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 it's very few industries, very few sectors in life where you can have a scapegoat and then promote the scapegoat. That's how much of an advantage Palantir had, and that's, that's repeated over and over again these other scandals. Uh, the, the scandal last year, they made the very same claim. First, they claimed, oh, no, we weren't involved, and then, oops, documents come out showing they were involved. Oh, just one employee. Uh, you know. Meanwhile, Christopher Wiley, the whistleblower, is is telling you know Parliament, no, there was executives from Palantir working side by side with uh, Cambridge, you know, on this stuff. And well, I mean, and that stuff is already not getting mentioned in the newer articles on Palantir. If you if you look, for instance, at the one uh, that the Intercept ran, uh, that Sam Biddle wrote. Uh, Sam Biddle's one one of the more dubious characters at the Intercept. Uh, there's no mention of, of the calendar of, of the team theme scandal, and there's no mention of the uh, the last year's uh, you know revelation about the the, the uh, electioneer about about scraping Facebook, uh, and, that, and that's true almost across the board. And if you look at the New York Times and search their archives for Palantir, you'll find that in 2011 they recounts you know some portions of the team theme scandal and Palantir's involvement, which of course they came to you know late after everybody else already done the legwork. Uh, then you'll see another article in the New York Times in 2014 where there is are worrying aloud about whether or not uh, Palantir is making enough money and, and, and taking as, as a serious claim Alexander Karp's uh, quote that, you know, we're worried about corroding our corporate culture if we, bring, if we bring money into this thing like that, which is a bizarre thing to say when you've been caught uh, participating in a plot to dig into the children of labor leaders and activists. Uh, you know, and that article includes a different, much more vanilla uh, version of the FEMA scandal that's all, that's inaccurate and incomplete, and uh, which they appear to have just gotten straight from the PRs, from a Palantir's PR guy. And then uh, a couple of years later, you know, on the election, using the same excuses, no mention whatsoever of any of this. This is how Palantir has managed to survive uh, and thrive, you know, despite having been caught in, a, you know, each new lie about what terrible things it's doing that, that strike, in many cases, uh, fundamentally at information, at, at the right to understand, at the right, at the right of the citizens to know, uh, and that's that's where we are, and that's why the, and that's why Palantir and this industry and the press's failures on this front uh, just frighten me. I mean, it, it, it's such a frightening thing to to have watched it unfold slowly, 
Uh, I think it's even, I think it's just as frightening when you go back and look, you know, just uh, through the articles over the years and just see how uh, we're not building on anything. Uh, we're not we're not building up a case against Palantir as, as a citizenry or as a press. We're we're giving them uh, sort of an alcohol extreme opportunity of, of you know a million second chances, and they're taking them. So, gotcha. You know, it's, it's, yeah. So I'm looking at this report. It's actually a little older than I thought. It's from last year, but it's still uh, pretty current information. And we are seeing developments now from the Trump administration suggesting there's going to be more ice raids in this coming summer. Um, so I'm just going to read you a quote from it. It says, currently about 10 percent of the Department of Homeland, Homeland Security's a uh, $44 billion budget is dedicated to data management, and a handful of huge corporations like Amazon Web Services and Palantir have built a quote-unquote revolving door to develop and entrench Silicon Valley's role in fueling the incarceration and deportation regime. Um, so what's your thoughts on that? I mean, so, so this is this is basically this is exactly what uh, this is what concerned us back then. Uh, this Palin, first of all, Palantir, of course, it is it deals in information and it does this in an age defined by information, an age in which information is the driving uh, force. Uh, you know, to an extent, even beyond uh, its normal fundamental value. Uh, a driving force behind everything, and it, and it handles information in a way that is of extraordinary value to the modern, you know, surveillance state uh, and everything else. You know, whether it be benign functions, malign, whatever, it's useful. Uh, you know, the, the UN uh, food program that, that caters to the most vulnerable people in the world uh, just a few months ago brought on Palantir to uh, service that, uh, and then here we are, you know, learning. You know, as we kind of suspected, uh, that Palantir has no problem engaging in uh, practices that, that, you know, most Americans uh, find uh, horrendous. You know, I mean, like, I'm not talking about Swedes or, like, people in the commune and so forth. I'm talking about Americans as a whole recognize that the family separation policy is horrendous. And, and here they are, uh, happily participating in it. That shouldn't be a surprise, given that uh, Andural, which is a sort of a spinoff company uh, founded by a number of their executives, uh, is primarily in the business, and this has you know been this is not even really hidden. Uh, primarily in the business of developing AI for drones to catch immigrants, uh, and they employ Matthew Steichen, that same guy, the, the scapegoat who got promoted after he uh, dug in his children. Uh, I mean, it's, it, this this is, um, and I and I, and I blame the press. Uh, there, there is no way that this would have that they would have had this momentum uh, had there been a, a, you know any reasonable degree of of you know just I don't even know how to characterize like I mean just I mean how, how do you characterize just like searching your own publications archives for information on the thing you're writing about which is what the New York Times could have done on all these occasions it's really hard to uh, it's hard to convey how just uh, how mundane. Uh, the issues here are in, in terms of how pounds are getting away with this. You know, it comes down to it. It's really coming down to uh, laziness, incompetence, mediocrity, uh, that sort of thing. It, it's, they don't even have to really uh, engage in a lot of the sort of high-end public relations and information ops that, that uh, you know, we might hope they would have to. Uh, they're just, they just go along their business and they, and they just assume the press will fuck up and forget about it. And they're always right. Uh, and this is the result. This is this is such a small part of what they are going to end up doing over time. I imagine. I mean, when you when you have your fingers in uh, predictive policing in New Orleans and electioneering with you know these firms like Archimedes and all that that are also being caught and uh, forgotten, uh, you're overseeing food programs with vulnerable people and you're catching immigrants. And there's no one sitting at the UN even saying, "Wait a second, this is the same firm that was lying about this and then doing this and and." Targeting these same vulnerable populations. It's run by a guy, Peter Thiel, who is one of essentially one of these dark enlightenment types. He is he is a person who is uh, dangerous because he shares these somewhat nihilistic or somewhat post uh, post liberal sort of post 
you know, post-humanist uh, ideals. But he's not a guy who's just sitting there, you know, writing blog posts about it. This is a guy that has been a position to exercise some of what he believes. And what he believes is extraordinarily dangerous uh, to, to this country, to this republic, and to, to the very institution of informed consent. He doesn't believe in it. And, and frankly, uh, from their standpoint, who could blame them? He, he, he looks at how this citizenry and how the press and Congress, uh, he sees how quickly they forget how poor they are at long-term planning, uh, how, how they are, aside from even making predictions, they are incapable of contending with basic information that they themselves have put out. And they, they come to the conclusion that someone has to rule humanity, and it's going to have to be, you know, uh, them. And so that's, that, that's the situation that would have been, I think, unimaginable, I think, mostly, 1995 or so, okay. that, we're now, that we're now in. So this is Peter Thiel, the uh, Silicon Valley kind of libertarian guru you're talking about, right? Yeah, he's, uh, and he's definitely identified, I know, with some libertarian groups, but he is, of course, a Trump backer uh, and, and a number of other things that would, I think, uh, det- uh, would separate him from the libertarians, uh, you know, mainstream, even a lot of the libertarian right. Like, the, the, guy, the guys who ended up, you know, were libertarians, but ended up supporting Bush in two different elections for some reason. Uh, you know, he, he's, he's less libertarian and more of a technocratic feudalist. Uh, that's, you know, and I think that's probably a, the, the the general, the general sort of, sort of a, I wouldn't call it a political ethos as such, but I think that's the general mentality you have. I think I think uh, they and many of the people in the national security complex and military intelligence, I think they all have a shared, kind of a, a vague, but shared uh, set of values that would all, uh, all very much find agreements in a setup where you know people like Peter Thiel. Are you know running in tandem with other people like that, and and you know with some pieces of the pie sliced out for you know national security and army, et cetera, uh, running the world. Um, and, and that's and that's one of those things that it, it, it's all the more uh, dangerous because I think it's, it's going to be hard for a lot of people to take those ideas seriously. It's very hard for people to take you know the transhumanist seriously. It's very hard for them to take anything that sounds like science fiction or anything that sounds like it's the it's the product of an uh, incel you know. Um, you know, blog post, uh, it, it's hard for people in general to look at and say, yeah, we, got, we have to start uh, preparing against this kind of thing. Um, and, and that's the problem because, because whether or not it sounds silly to us and whether or not it sounds feasible to the average person who's not a, uh, you know, on this very different level uh, in terms of, in terms of what, what, what a person can do and what, you know, uh, what they're willing to do, uh, then it's Peter Thiel it's very hard to assess or identify what this person is and what he represents and and what he may do in the future. And I think we've proven that over and over again in the past nine years as he continues to gain power. So let's back up a second, because what the hell is a transhumanist to begin with? Well, that's a tough one, but uh, I mean, someone would argue that, you know, uh, a man a couple thousand years ago who attaches a stick to his uh, broken leg is a transhumanist. He has he has brought some artificial, you know, artificiality into his being and, and has transcended, you know, his physical limitations. But I mean, more popularly, I mean, I think I think the, the common understanding, I think that, both, you know, transhumanists themselves and the ones who, uh, who you know, find them amusing, I think they would agree on is that it's sort of a, it's a, it's a urge towards immortality. It's an urge towards uh, the sorts of things that, you know, alchemists and, uh, you know, hermeticists and, and the educated classes of, you know, last couple thousand years uh, always kind of had in the back of their minds, and which now, thanks to technology, the real magic, uh, are feasible. Uh, it, it's not, you know, there, there's a great deal of, uh, there's a great deal of interesting symbolism uh, that comes up in this uh, industry. I mean, Palantir and, uh, you know, and Earl, both named after magical implements from the Lord of the Rings. Uh, think about someone like Peter Thiel who has, uh, created this product that searches, you know, that searches the world, you know, that, that, that gives that gives something uh, approaching omniscience to the power to the powerful, in which he can he can provide and take away at will. Uh, he can you know he can and has used it, you know, to uh, support a, a very uh, what would have seemed like an unrealistic bid for the presidency by Trump. Uh, he's used it for you know. Uh, Whatever else we haven't caught him, caught him uh, using it for yet, 
And he has to think of himself uh, very much as sort of a Superman. Okay. And yeah, so and, and so uh, that's I mean that's kind of getting to another subject, but uh, it, it just. It, as always, when we're, when we're dealing with people who are powerful and we're dealing with people who uh, deal with other powerful people, we have to get we have to remember that they are not uh, they're not freelancers and they're not, you know, they're not uh, the kind of people that surround us every day. These, these are the kind of people that pop up in history. They're the, sort of the great men uh, and they're very dangerous and they don't they have a different idea of what's possible. And sometimes that idea is right. And in the case of Peter Thiel. He's just the perfect mixture of uh, capability, uh, uh, you know, nihilism, for lack of a better term, uh, luck, and uh, an environment in which someone like him can uh, proceed uh, without any any force being arrayed to 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 hold him in. Uh, you know, uh, not even like a congressional committee. I mean, that's so. I, I imagine that he has uh, expansive plans, and then I imagine there's going to be others, you know, in this industry, in the intelligence contracting industry, in the data analytics industry. Uh, you know, I, I, I've spent a lot of time looking at these people's emails, you know, over the years, obviously, and I've I've seen kind of what even low end guys like Eli Bingham and Matthew Stegman, I've seen how they consider themselves, and I've seen how you know Aaron Bard, H.B. Gary, Greg Hoagland, they believe that they are the the true. Uh, they believe that they're sort of the new aristocracy. Uh, they don't believe in democracy anymore, any more than anyone else does these days. I mean, deep down, uh, and they, you know, they're very national security oriented, and that's a horrible combination. It's a very dangerous combination. Yeah, what you're describing sounds a lot of it is indebted to Nietzsche, and therefore can lend itself very quickly to that kind of, well, for lack of a better phrasing, the stuff that eventuated the Hitler philosophy. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And, and it's not a coincidence that, you know, Thiel and them have uh, been very, very uh, helpful to Trump. Uh, I mean, this is a kleptocracy that, that, that's building around us. And, uh, it, you know, it exists in some extent in different parts of the world, obviously, the Russia, uh, the Cuban kleptocracy, the Saudis, uh, you know, the Chinese are, are arguably like sort of uh, interspersed with the kleptocracy that, you know, some of the more uh, forward-thinking people, you know, the, the more uh, sensualist types uh, are trying to dispel. But the kleptocracy is, you know, is one of the major forms that governance and, and society is going to take uh, increasingly in the absence of, you know, uh, you know, sheer civic virtue, for lack of a better term. That's what, it, that's what comes about uh, when there is, when, when, the, when the virtues that allowed a citizenry, no matter what else its faults were, that allows the citizenry to uh, keep a check on these things when those virtues no longer exist, uh, when they're replaced slowly by, you know, uh, a broader nihilism, you know, a, a broader sort of hipsterist sort of, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of things we we saw from Gawker back in the day. Uh, right. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm going to continue in some of the stuff that's in this report because it seems like it's we're getting headlines now from Washington Post, New York Times. I mean, mainstream publications have been covering a story where the recent purge in Homeland Security Department was tied intimately to this insane uh, mass purge effort that Trump is trying to push and the people he ousted while they're, uh, you know, unpardonable in the general spectrum of sanity, they actually were a little more to the left of him in saying that logistically his yeah. ideas were nuts and would just be a complete nightmare. Um, so ICE is prepared. The quote says ICE is preparing to use tech for mass deportation at an unprecedented scale that would make sanctuary cities and state-level protections obsolete. Uh, ICE wants to organize mass personal information it buys from private vendors, such as license plate info, collect biometric info in mass quantities, such as fingerprints, iris scans, facial recognition software, buy the cloud space to store the data and hire people to analyze mass data information, all for surveilling, arresting, and deporting immigrants. These programs 
have enormous implications for the protective policies in cities and states by making the separation of information impossible, granting full access to Trump's federal police force. Uh, Amazon and Palantir are two companies at the forefront of these developments, providing collection, storage, and management of the vast amount of information required by ICE to increase its reach to the levels promised by Trump. Um, and then it says, uh, both companies have enabled DHS to apply new technologies and expand its data sharing capabilities to undermine and get around any local protections that were hard, hard fought and won by immigrant rights organizers. This interoperability has effectively expanded the reach of immigration enforcement by rendering detentions and deportations more likely to occur. Um, and further down, it says Palantir is building ICE, ICE's case management software, tech that allows immigration agents to scour regional, local, state, and federal databases across the country, build profiles of immigrants and their friends and family based on private and public information, and use those profiles to surveil, track, and ultimately deport immigrants. Uh, so. What's your reaction to that? You know, it's it's uh, I'd, I'd say it's, it's it's generally hard to frighten me these days, but that's the kind of thing that does it. Um, it the, the frightening aspect is that I, I think uh, feel on the one hand, and you know, a lot of a lot of the administration officials and others, you know, and many people behind the Republican Party, I think they know. I think they've got a pretty good sense that uh, to the, now that they have the means of really effectively doing this. Uh, they have very little war to worry about in terms of opposition. I mean, we've, they've seen what the resistance is, uh, what it helped materialize. It, 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 it's hashtags. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's uh, physical protests. Uh, they know that uh, in the absence of uh, sort of insurgency, you know, sort of, a, you know, of a uh, low-level kind of insurgency of the sort that we used to practice, anonymous these things, uh, or even with the, you know, more, you know, Journalistic, more sort of straightforward uh, stuff that we did with Project PM, with, you know, just going through researching, trying to keep the press uh, on task. They know that when these now these things have been kind of neutralized over the years, uh, that was even that was barely a pinprick. What we did uh, had almost no effect whatsoever, other than at least to, to get the information out there so that we could understand these things. Uh, now that that era is kind of over, for now, uh, there is absolutely nothing uh, to prevent that. There's just, there's nothing. And so, you know, I, I hope that, you know, with, when this does happen, I hope that it at least uh, provides the kind of shock to the American people that doesn't, doesn't go, that doesn't, that doesn't dissipate so quickly. Like, you know, like after, right after the Trump's election, you know, that palpable feeling people had just wondering, you know, even if you consider, you know, uh, correctly all the previous presidents to be, you know, extraordinary criminals themselves. Uh, just the fact that someone like that could could uh, gain power uh, in that means, with that persona, uh, saying those things, uh, regardless of what you thought Trump was going to do, it was obviously a bad sign. It was something that, that really they kind of uh, exposed as a, as nonsense, uh, happy talk about the American people and, and what they are, what they believe in, and what they care about. Uh, it, it showed a lot of people uh, what this country is really composed of. And so I hope so. Something like this, um, you know, it should be opposed. Uh, it, it will be, I'm sure, by various means. Uh, to the extent that it, you know, to the extent that it becomes visible, to the extent that, you know, which I imagine would have to be. But I hope that, regardless, uh, that will be a wake-up call. That this isn't the 20th century anymore, late 20th century. This isn't in the 90s, uh, and that. You know the, the things that we, we that we're used to, they were, the, the norms we're used to. Uh, those those were always hanging by a thread, and, and that thread is gone. And uh, uh, with climate change uh, roped into that, and and with you know powerful factions uh, preparing for, for you know those eventualities that come with climate change. Uh, this is good. this is a preview of the kind of things that. This, this this citizenry is just not ready for. The press is not ready for. It's it's not. 
it's not going to be able it's not going to be able to bring to bear what is needed in response to this kind of uh, atrocity, which is what it will be. It'll be an atrocity. Um, you know, not not just because of Palinzer, but because of, of the, the ways, the manner in which this is always done. You know, the the degree to which these uh, people who are uh, powerless and uh, despised and dehumanized by a portion of the population here, uh, a portion of them is always uh, victimized in the process of removing them, and uh, afterwards as well. And I think even that process, even if even if we uh, pretend that it will be done in some way that is not uh, sort of a massive psychic scar on this country and on those uh, who are to be deported. Uh, it's the kind of thing that, uh, you know, I know the word normalized is uh, perhaps going around too much, but I, I think there's no other word here. It normalizes uh, that, sort of, uh, that sort of activity. And that's the last thing we need. And it's probably the first thing we'll get. That's I mean, in response to all this, I mean, these are the kind of things that uh, the silver lining, from my standpoint, uh, as as a you know somewhat militant agitator, uh, is that some of the, some of the illusions, some some of the some of the gloss, the gloss and the uh, trappings that the U.S. still has by virtue of you know the last 30, 40, 50 years and the myth making and all that. Uh, That'll deteriorate fast, and it'll become much more viable to bring in mainstream people, as it kind of has been the last couple of years since Trump was elected, uh, into different kinds of policies, different kinds of sort of civic reactions, different kinds of uh, opposition movements that, uh, just like Palantir and his companies, take advantage of the information age uh, that we do as well in our own way. Gotcha. So – Here's one question that arises, and they're kind of interconnected. Um, the first is if you think like boycotts of Amazon can be a useful weapon to push back against them because besides all of this mess, there's a whole range of issues that people don't comprehend are aimed to cause further detrimental harm to the public welfare um, and then as a kind of striking contrast, we have the personage of Tim Cook at Apple, who, uh, though he's undesirable for a number of reasons, has made data privacy a major issue. And I'm wondering what your diagnosis is of his efforts, or is it all a sham on his part? Well, that's, that's actually a very important example because it, it helps it, – it speaks to something that is another factor here that always has to be kept in mind. But Tim Cook, uh, regardless of his intentions, uh, a company like Apple, just like the Pentagon or just like you know, uh, you know, uh, these other firms, uh, they are not able to steer the ship in the way they necessarily want it to go. Uh, the ship is multifaceted. It's, it's, uh, it is compartmentalized. And uh, both Google and Apple have these national security divisions that uh, have already been, uh, you know, we're already working towards a uh, recompete deal uh, with, with the U.S. government, with some facet of the Pentagon, uh, with a lot of these the most the worst firms. Like Apple and Google were both had meetings in 2010 with Aaron Barr, the CEO of HP Gary, the one that did, the one that was everyone was running away from, the one that was like, was so bad that Palantir tried to scapegoat him. Uh, they didn't know anything about HB, about Aaron Barr and what else he was doing, uh, and they were also there to meet with TASC, uh, which is a you know more traditional company that you know from that standpoint is is a respectable firm, uh, plus Archimedes, which you know no one really knew much about what they did, but which later popped up with Cambridge Analytica, of course, in the uh, 2016 election and before that the Romans coin thing, uh, and I wrote about all this back then. This came out of the HB Gary emails, and I wrote you know I, I had an article coming out for Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera dropped it. Uh, turns out this Romas coin project, I'm assuming the Qatar government must have been involved because I've never had that happen before. Published it in Guardian. Uh, you know, there was some commentary about it here and there. Uh, you know, raw stories, some, uh, foreign newspapers, their Spiegel or some other German paper. And that was it. Totally forgotten. And even the Apple and Google parts, which, which you know, normally you would think uh, are going to be, you know, it's going to be a hell of a story, right? Um, never took off. 
And even when I was in prison, even after I won the National Magazine Award for The Intercept, and I tried to mention this thing again, which I'd already written about again in The Guardian, uh, which Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Schaefer had uh, spoke about, you know, and saying, yeah, this is, you know, this is a legitimate thing. Uh, my editor over there he used to be, yeah, he used to be um, Ken's editor as well. He was at Harper's. Uh, he didn't believe it. And even without seeing the email on which this is based, uh, which is the same emails that all these other things uh, came out of, that, you know, that no one has ever questioned, uh, just decided it couldn't be true, based on again just some vague heuristic that you know some editors have that you know I, I don't even I don't even know what the heuristic would be. Uh, that should give you a sense of a you know of what, Tim Cook doesn't know what his people are doing. Uh, B his people don't know what they're doing because they they don't necessarily know who they're getting involved with and who is going to be transferring these ideas and methodologies and contacts and technology and using them. Uh, in other ways that would be far more deleterious. Uh, you know, same thing with Google. That, that's just one example. That's just one example of, of, a, of uh, when Apple and Google both got involved with not just H.P. Gary, but again, Archimedes, the same company that did, that did uh, later worked at Cambridge Analytica and Palliser, you know, in, in trying to uh, subvert or, or, or uh, create a massive disinformation product uh, sitting around the 2016 election and apparently Brexit as well. That's, that should give you a sense of how difficult it is, even when we have a CEO who means well and, and perhaps is competent enough to execute something like that. Uh, they're up against that, and there's very little incentive uh, for them to go looking around uh, in the national security areas, and there's very little incentive for the national security types to uh, you know, make that any clearer than they have to, what they're doing. Um, you know, I mean, but take it this, put it this way. Uh, if, we, if we pretend... That Palantir wasn't lying about Alexander Carp, you know, not being aware of these things, even though we have the emails showing he was and all that. Then uh, that should be that should serve as a great example of uh, these companies with these technologies, these assets. Uh, they're going to be misused. Uh, you know, of course, we know Palantir, you know, knew fully well what was going on. But even even their pretend version, even their uh, their face saving, uh, you know, uh, plausible deniability version. Uh, paints a very somber picture. And that, that's, that applies across the board. Uh, that's, that's every company. It's AT&T, which was also actually uh, discussed in that Romas coin uh, operation. Uh, and, and in the technology, every technology, every methodology, every, every idea and, uh, and technique and practice, uh, they get sucked up by the Chinese in something like the Aurora attacks years ago. Uh, the Russians get them. Uh, some of these guys sell them, you know, to Bahrain, Saudi Arabia. Uh, they're used against protesters there uh, from there on. Uh, all these things are going to get out. They already have. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a, it is a, it's a dynamic that is, that is going to be coming into play so thoroughly and in such, such a, a way that is difficult to assess at any time because a lot of these technologies are by nature, by, by design, hard to detect when we talk about disinformation, that kind of thing. Uh, it, it, as bad as things are now in terms of uh, information flow, in terms of uh, you know uh, trustworthiness, in terms of credibility, in terms of being able to assess what is going on, uh, it's going to get vastly worse, and it's not going to be clear uh, to a lot of people why that is. Uh, that's that's a that's a disaster. I mean, that's a, that's a fundamental that that is a disaster that hits us fundamentally at the very point at which we have to be clear, and that's that's our ability to determine who is and is, isn't doing what to us with our money and our governments. Gotcha. Um, I'm looking at a chart within this report, and it brings up a name of a couple other corporations besides Amazon and Palantir. Uh, Forensic Logic Incorporated, which is based out of Walnut Creek, California. Thomson Reuters Corporation, uh, oh. that... They actually were serving as a data broker with a large ICE contract that interfaces with Palantir and Forensic Logic for sharing of yep. data sets. A uh, company called IDM, IDEMIA France SAS or IDEMIA. Um, with IDEMIA, you said? Yeah, it has a U.S. subsidiary called MorphoTrack in Anaheim. Um, and a majority shareholder is the private equity firm Advent International in Boston. Um, 
and they are a multimodal biometric tech provider for DHS and FBI. They have an estimated 80% market share for real ID compliant cards, which are the uh, license laws that have been rolled out in the past 10 years. Um, and then NEC Corporation in Tokyo, uh, which has a U.S. subsidiary located in Irving, Texas. I'm wondering if those names jump out at you. Well, uh, Thomson Reuters, I'll, I'll, I'll have you cite the first one and last one again. I, I, was, I just pulled up the uh, WikiLeaks deal, which still has all these sets. You know, every time a new firm comes up or a new person or a new uh, technique, you know, we, we go back go back and search through them through the Stratford emails, the HP Gary emails, all these and oftentimes you'll get a hit, uh, and you'll have people discussing it. You'll, you'll that that's how just in the past couple of weeks I found stuff uh, involving you know General Flynn, his old company, which was also involved in this uh, electioneering stuff and all that one. Um, and so I'll take a look. Thomson Reuters. That, I mean that's that's what struck out at me because you know this this is uh, I mean Reuters itself has been caught, and again this speaks to what my concerns generally always are, which is how is the press going to handle this? Is it going to you know how, how's it going to pretend with this? Uh, you know. Reuters did a extraordinarily terrible job of covering these issues back in 2011, 2012. Uh, one of the worst. They actually had to do, make two corrections uh, in the last 60 days uh, of articles from 2011 to 2012 uh, because uh, I kind of uh, made it clear to them that it needed to be done. Uh, they have they, they've been cut, they have a number of reporters and editors who keep turning up uh, involved. Uh, in some illicit way, with these big companies that are running it, like Monsanto, for instance, that was that was kind of a, one of the more better known uh, scandals. And uh, but anyway, Thompson Reuters, I happened to notice uh, a couple months ago, I had a whole big long thread on Twitter about uh, about Reuters. Uh, I, was, I was just compiling just a number of things I had uh, you know picked up on them, or they were already already public or whatever. And Tom, you know, they just deleted their uh, their press release that they had uh, must have come up in 2010, like 2010, about their new partnership with Palantir. And uh, you, 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 link, you click on the link, and it goes to uh, the press release that's now been deleted. It's still the Wikipedia page, though, for, uh, for either Palantir or Reuters. I think, yeah, for Palantir, which is how I knew about it. Um, you know, that, that's, that's always frightening, I think, when, when it's, it's the parent company. Uh, I don't know if you have the exact relationship, but uh, I guess Thomson Reuters didn't start. Anyway, uh, that, that is always a little bit more uh, disconcerting, you know, when you've got, you know, the, the media conglomerates uh, – for something that a lot of people look at a wire service like Reuters and Associated Press and think of it, as, uh, they, they think of it as the good old days. I mean, they think of it as something that's, uh, you know, just just you know, very solid, uh, you know, trustworthy, you know, a real real news. Uh, and it's quite the contrary. And so to see them pop up yet again uh, in this, you know, in this kind of uh, grouping, uh, it shows you know if there's any any doubts. That they weren't letting that tweet, that old uh, press release, out of embarrassments and thinking, "Oh God, I can't believe we got involved with those people." Uh, they are more than happy to keep to keep it up, uh, and and that's the world we're looking at. You know, where we have our news conglomerates working closely with the same companies that are putting out its information uh, on a scale unimaginable uh, to anyone in the 20th century. Can you read me uh, what was the last name of the last company and the, and the first one? The first one is Forensic Logic. Incorporated. Forensic logic. Okay, yeah. Let me, let me, let me. And uh, here's the thing. I just uh, I, look, I just looked up Thompson Reuters uh, in the uh, WikiLeaks email. This is for Hacking Team, that Italian firm that was one of the many firms involved in uh, providing surveillance uh, software to dictatorships. Uh, there's a number of companies that, that we found doing that uh, over the years, and uh, this is one of the worst. Uh, here I have a uh, hacking team disgusting a Thomson Reuters uh, reporter. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll put this aside because it's off the go record. Read this, but uh, you know, there's going to be plenty more than that. I guarantee you, and there's going to be some. I guarantee there's going to be some illicit conduct where you know. Anyway, uh, you, see, you said forensic. What was the other one? Forensic something. Forensic logic. Forensic logic doesn't come up, but uh, and uh, so what was the, and what was the uh, the two last ones? There was. I, D as in dog, E as in Edward, M as in Michael, I as in Ignatius, A as in Adam, France, S-A-S. More folks, right? Yeah, so, yeah, so, so none, of the, none of those uh, other names uh, struck out at me. Uh, okay. Struck out at me. Um, 
Gotcha. So, so that is, they may be new, they may be you know among the many, many the hundreds that we obviously never came across uh, or forgot about. You know, who knows that? But again, the great thing is that we can. You know, there is there is some degree of institutional memory, and so much that these these this this huge body of uh, of chatter and applications for for contracts and all that. Uh, it is all searchable, and that's and that's extraordinary. That's a, that's a great advantage uh, when these things come up. Um, you know, at the same time, um, it, it makes it all the more distressing when you go back and look at how uh, how many inaccuracies there were uh, to the advantage of these firms uh, when these things were covered. Right. And uh, yeah, so, are there any things you want to be- bring up in closing? Uh, yes. Cool. You know, in in uh, you know, in twenty. About two weeks before I went to prison, before I was arrested back in, I think, August, late August 2012, uh, when I was still heavily involved with Anonymous, and in fact, increasingly so because the situation was, was more desperate. Uh, you know, I've been raided by the FBI uh, with a search warrant listing H.P. Gary, in-game systems, one, one, one of the other firms that we caught um, in this uh, scandal with Palantir back then. Uh, you know, Project PM, our group, the National on 2org org, was our old wiki. Um, I launched an operation, what we used to call it, it's a very simple operation called Op NYT, Op New York Times. And uh, it, was, it, was pretty, it was basically centered around me publishing my correspondence with the New York Times over the past year and a half. And much of that concerned uh, my efforts to try to get them interested in H.B. Gary, Palantir, uh, persona management, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and there's a guy named Adrian Chen. He's Robert Gawker back then. Wrote about six, seven articles on me. Most of them, but you know, all bizarrely negative. Uh, he wrote an article for Gawker on that. You know, he, he knew it was me behind this operation, and uh, he he wrote this. He wrote this. You know, he 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 mocks me for the idea that New York Times. You know, you know of course, I'm using New York Times kind of as a, as a you know a symbol, of course. But I mean, but they do from my standpoint kind of have a extra duty to uh, lead the way on some of these things if they're going to have all that, uh, that legacy behind them. Uh, he mocked the idea that they should be, you know, should cover this more, you know. Uh, and he, you know, he, you know like the, the exact phrase was, you know, why should they have uh, had to cover, uh, quote, every boring detail, unquote, you know, in these emails. And, you know, the, the, aside from the things that I, we'd already found back then, you know, that we were, people were going to prison over. Uh, and that people spent, you know, about a year and a half digging through to present all these things, many of which ha- had been covered in the press, at least a little bit. Uh, you know, th- this was where the real story was in these emails. This is where this was where Palantir and the extent of, the extent of its activities. Uh, this, is, this is a jumping off point for that. This was where you could find persona management, which was this, this uh, application involving uh, fake online people uh, using software to, so that a uh, in this case, in the Syncom project that was uh, that was being done for, you know, allow a single airman at a base in you know in uh, in McDill or uh, Bagram to control ten uh, very sophisticated uh, online people, you know, with real names, real uh, backgrounds, IP address, you know, it's, it's super ideal software that facilitates uh, allows for not just translation in real time, but maintaining a certain uh, you know linguistic style. Uh, retaining a lot of the information that one would ideally want to be able to, you know, keep keep a, keep on track if they're controlling a sock puppet, uh, the kind of thing that you know back then was very new. Uh, people could conceptualize it. You know, sock puppets were already a term, uh, but which frightened a lot of people, including us. Uh, Atlantic, Guardian, Raw Story, uh, not in that order, uh, covered this. You know, it was, it was it was mentioned. You know, in other places, I gave talks on it when I went on TV and stuff. Over and over again, and uh, some years later, uh, you know, about seven months ago, uh, New York Times comes across, and some of these things that are being kind of kicked up in the Miller investigation, uh, they come across Side Group, S P S Y dash uh, Group, a company in Israel, you know, run uh, that had dealt with the Trump administration, had offered to use their services uh, uh, in their support. Uh, they're, they're the thing that the operation they cited specifically was manipulating. Uh, electors, the Electoral College, uh, on Trump's behalf. And uh, they also know they could do any number of other things. Uh, the, the Trump administration did not, it looks like, actually pay for that service, but according to this uh, ex-Basad founder, uh, they wouldn't have had it and did much of it anyway. Um, 
And then so there's some articles came out in the New Yorker, uh, New York Times, elsewhere about what else they, they definitely did. Uh, and in none of these articles, and none of the commentary on this, uh, none of the people involved in this, uh, you know, Frank Sinatra is on there, who's, who's out there, I'm sure he's a pretty very good reporter, you know, in general, uh, you his real name is, supposedly Woody Allen, son, Federalist in the New Yorker. You know, they all covered this, you know, in great depth and, you know, came out in these major publications uh, that are read widely by the media. And at no point, as far as I can tell, did anyone realize this was the exact same thing that had come up uh, nine years prior, eight years prior, uh, and that a great deal of documentation had been created on, you know, a, a foundation on which to, to build. Uh, we had company names, you know, Intrapid, Intrapid's on my cubic, it's, you know, all, all of this stuff that was fought over back then, uh, you know, and which would have perhaps helps to inform this issue and, and made it clear that this is not a one-off thing. This eccentric um, Assad agent was, was you know, doing this company. The, the company is now liquidated. It, it's, not, it's not a thing. It's over. It's not a, uh, you know, it's not just a, 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 a warning signal. This is part of a, a line uh, that, that, is, that is shooting upwards and that we can track, you know, from patents in 2008, 2009, with IBM and the military. Uh, we, we can already see the kind of people that were involved in. Uh, involved in producing these kind of capabilities, and that includes Aaron Barr and everybody else at H.B. Gary, the same people who were working to set up activists and journalists, um, and we're getting clients who were interested in that. Uh, and it, it's just, it, there's no, once again, there is no institutional memory. Uh, all of this stuff, which Aaron, Aaron Schwartz, you know, did a FOIA request on persona management for us. It was, it was the only time I ever spoke to Aaron Schwartz, I didn't really know much about him, was uh, in regards to this. Uh, it was something that he like a lot of people who were uh, very well versed in the internet and its vulnerabilities, uh, thought was important and dangerous. And uh, you know, like like a lot of other things, it just it got uh, it got disregarded ultimately. And even though, again, even though it's in the Atlantic, even though it's in you know some Guardian articles here and there, even though it was discussed, you know, it, it was it was clearly a important issue. Uh, the fact that the name has now changed. They don't call it persona management anymore. Uh, that was enough to, to divorce uh, the consciousness of the press. The press is specialized in these things uh, from, you know, from the chronology here. It, it was enough to cut off all of that useful work that could have been used by them to, to expand upon this and say, hey, uh, this is one of many uh, information platforms that you know, we had, weren't really thinking about years ago, but given what's happened since, uh, perhaps you know, requires some really extraordinary uh, focus. Uh, and that didn't happen because uh, we, we have a uh, ner central nervous system, this republic, as it were, that is just not capable of making it happen. And that's, uh, you know, that's always frightening uh, when you have that degree of failure, systemic failure, uh, but it's especially frightening uh, when it happens in the press uh, and it keeps happening. Uh, especially when what, what they're forgetting is something that is uh, very hard to detect. You only get to detect it every couple of years, uh, largely when someone screws up and uh, people tend to go to prison as a result. Uh, that's that that should uh, I think I hope that kind of explains uh, why it is that you know I, I think it's going to require, quite frankly, something more than the usual civic opposition and the articles here and there because uh, I've seen it. I've, I've seen that happen. And, uh, you know, the, the institutions we're dealing with are, have, have, uh, have, have just gone way beyond. And then the clients that they have, you know, Bahrain and all that, you know, uh, th these are foreign dictatorships. Uh, and that's, that's not even counting the things that are being done here that are about to be done vis-a-vis uh, -vis immigrants. So, you know. Gotcha. Either, either, the, either the citizenry will radicalize or the citizenry will cease to become a citizenry. It'll become a sort of a, a unknowing subject population under people like Peter Thiel and, and whatever else comes next. For more information on why Barrett Brown was censored, read his account on Medium.com. I'm proud to be the first National Magazine Award winner to be kicked off Twitter at the request of a Nazi. Yes, that's the title. Brown writes, quote, All of this comes a day after my Facebook account was suspended for 30 days. Coincidentally enough, the morning after our anti-ICE slash 
Palantir Information Operations Campaign, hashtag Op Claudia, was launched to widespread interest among press and citizens alike, and then murdered by thugs like its namesake. The 20-year-old immigrant Claudia Gomez, herself shot to death by border agents who thereafter proceeded to lie about the circumstances. We here at Washington Babylon remain in strong solidarity with Barrett Brown and hope to see a speedy resolution of this matter in a way that is satisfactory for his interests and his professional career. The following has been produced as part of a crowdfunding campaign for the website Washington Babylon, edited by the investigative journalist Ken Silverstein. If you would like to support Ken's investigation, visit patreon.com slash dcbabylon. That's patreon.com slash dcbabylon. N. It's common to find corrupt members of Congress, but Senator Marco Rubio, really, I can't think of anyone dirtier. Um, going back to his early days, his brother-in-law, uh, as I recall, was a coke trafficker, and young Marco, as a teenager, used to, as I recall, walk the dogs and mow the lawn of the brother-in-laws. The thing is, you could say, well, he was just the dog walker or the lawn mower, but this was a major coke trafficker, and little Marco never noticed anything funny. Uh, I mean, they were dealing a ton of, well, I, I don't want to say 2,000 pounds, it probably was more, I don't really know. It was a major drug trafficking operation, and little Marco was too goddamn stupid to notice anything. Or maybe he did notice something and they paid him, you know, $100 an hour to walk the dogs. I mean, I can't answer that question, but that's one of the things I'm going to be looking at. There are so many. He has a long time association with one of the most crooked individuals in the state of Florida. And when you say one of the most crooked individuals in the state of Florida, I mean, I don't even know what compares to that. I mean, in the city of New Orleans, I mean, in the city of Chicago, uh, in the outer circles of hell, I just, you know, I mean, David Rivera, they are long time party friends, love to party, love to go out on the town and have a good time, love to consort with lobbyists. He's a family man, so I would not want to cast aspersions on he or Mr. Rivera. However, if one were to do a Google search, one would find some very interesting things. I've written a few things about Mr. Rubio. I won't call him Senator Rubio. That's a degraded term as it is. But this is a guy who I wrote a story for the New York Observer. Anybody can Google my name, Marco Rubio, and I did a few stories, but one in particular will come up uh, about his real estate transactions, where, you know, it, let's just say he obtained how his, his first house. I think he had three houses. I can't remember how many lady friends. Just friends. I mean, not, not saying they were girlfriends or lovers. I'm just saying they were intimate companions. Um good family man, so I wouldn't want to suggest in any way there was more than that. Uh, but you can read my New York Observer piece where he declined comment on anything having to do with how he obtained housing his homes very, 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 very cheaply and always managed to make money on these real estate transactions where campaign donors or bankers he knew or people who might again, I don't want to cast versions of people who might want favors from Mr. Rubio uh, helped him out. Uh, there was a crooked doctor involved in one of these transactions, a Medicare fraudster. He's got a lot of interesting friends, um, and he had no comment about this. I mean, you know, if I were called and said, are you a crook? 
And do you like to party with David Rivera? And do you have some intimate lobbyist female companions? You know, I don't care personally what people do in their private lives, but if you're a U.S. senator, as Mr. Rubio is, a lot of what he does has the appearance of impropriety. So I'll be looking into the dirty, dirty path of this man, but I'll be also focusing on his disgusting role as the chief cheerleader and sponsor of the attempt to overthrow the government of Venezuela. I mean, you know, I would say the three most powerful individuals all should be rotting in jail cells are Rubio, John Bolton, and uh, uh, Elliot Abrams. And Rubio was there first. I mean, Trump ultimately bears responsibility for the criminal sanctions that are punishing the people of Venezuela, strangling the country, and not harming the leadership. And no question there is serious corruption among the leadership in the Venezuelan government. I mean, that's not even open to question. However, they're not hurting President Maduro in any way. I understand why the Venezuelan people are tired and exhausted and they are not happy necessarily with President Maduro. But I have been to Venezuela a few months ago and I'll be going back as part of my reporting in addition to going down to Florida. So we very definitely need to raise the money for this story. Um, and, you know, the situation there, I'm not going to say it's 100% the cause of the United States, but you read newspaper stories where they say the people are starving. Well, the government does give a monthly food basket to everybody in the poor areas, which is most of the country. I saw it with my own eyes and wrote about it at Washington Babylon, Caracas Chronicles. If you Google that and Washington Babylon, you'll find this story. Um, you'll find pictures. I was in the poor areas where I was, you know, fed, well fed, well taken care of. Um, I'm not going to say Venezuela is a paradise. Of course it's not. It's a very difficult situation. It's complicated. But if there's any man who is evil in regard to his conduct to, towards Venezuela, it's Marco Rubio. I mean, you have to sort of wonder because he's, you know, famously, he, his family were Cuban fascists, anti Castro. Uh, but I don't know why he's got a hard on for Venezuela. I mean, and this is one of the things that I'll be looking at. Something's there. You know, maybe he took some dirty money. I'm, speculation, of course, from a uh, Venezuelan businessman close to the government and uh, got burned on the deal. I don't know what his obsession is. And lastly, I am also going to be focusing on his best friend in Venezuela, Leopoldo Lopez, praised in the U.S. media as a hero and a freedom fighter. I can guarantee you this guy is going to look very, very ugly when I'm done with my reporting. His family is extremely rich. They own a lot of property. I don't believe all that property was obtained legally or that they've disclosed the ownership of it. And Leopoldo Lopez is a party goer, just like Marco Rubio. You know, Marco used to mow the lawn for coke traffickers. I don't know. I mean, I've just heard stories. It may have just been NyQuil, but, you know, from what I understand, Mr. Uh, Lopez the Trump administration's bitch uh, in Venezuela and Marco Rubio's God knows what, potentially a business partner, who the hell knows, um, they are not going to be happy with what I report. That's what I can guarantee you. I can't guarantee you I'll uncover every stone and find every fact, but I will guarantee you that Marco Rubio, Donald Trump, John Bolton, Elliot Abrams, and uh, Leopoldo Lopez are going to be pissed off when they see my report. All I'm looking for is $1,200 because I know everybody's pressed for money. That's not even going to cover my cost. I'm looking for money elsewhere. I'm trying to find a sponsor that will pay for my plane ticket to Venezuela. I mean, there's $1,200. You, you know the expenses aren't going to come close. i got to go to Florida. I don't, I'm happy to do it. It's going to be a great reporting trip down to Miami, 
uh, possibly Tallahassee and to Caracas. So that's not going to be, you know, at twelve hundred, I'm going to lose. But I'm going to raise other money, and we'll publish some great stories at Washington and Babylon, and I'll probably publish a few stories elsewhere to make money because I got to hustle. Because, as you know, journalism is not the most profitable pr- profession unless you are well, like a lot of our uh, U.S. journalists, uh, not terribly critical or skeptical or honest, and that's you know the fastest route to success. But we try to do a little bit better at Washington Bell. Preceding has been produced as part of a crowdfunding campaign for the website Washington Babylon, edited by the investigative journalist Ken Silverstein. Music credits are as follows. The songs Hacienda and Akari were produced and distributed by the website Filmstro, while The International was produced by Jerry Engelbach. All music has been used in this package on the basis of properly recognized and adhered to licenses with their creators. If you would like to support Ken's investigation, visit patreon.com slash dcbabylon. That's patreon.com slash dcbabylon. Thanks for listening and be sure to tune in next week. This is the Washington Babylon Podcast, hosted by Ken Silverstein and produced by Andrew Stewart.